charts, and graphs, and what they were looking for is, you know, what are the signs, you know, uh, you know how, what leads up to a currency collapse, what are the signs of it, what are the patterns, and they were looking, that's what they were looking for. And down here they say our message is simple, we've been here before. And so they're saying that all of these other countries have gone through this before, <coughs> How does this relate to us in the United States? And so the way I think about this book and these guys' work is, have you ever seen one of those teenage slasher movies? No. No. <laughs> Never. <laughs> anyway, but usually the teenage slasher, you know, they're all staying in a house for the summer or whatever until, you know, the, the guy with the chainsaw shows up and one by one, the teenagers start disappearing. And there's always a scene in those movies where the teenage girl is walking past the door to the basement and she hears a noise. <coughs> and you know what's happening next. What's happening next is she's going to go open up the door and walk down this dimly lit hallway <laughs> into the basement where the psycho killer is, is, is hiding. It's predictable. It's in every one of those movies. And um, the Reinhardt and Rogoff are basically the people sitting in the audience yelling at the screen at the teenage girl telling her not to go in the basement. What are you, crazy? And the teenage girl is the U.S. economy and the slasher is the debt. So if you've seen enough of those movies, you know how they always go. You can see the teenage girl going into trouble and she always goes in the basement every single time. And that's what these guys have found. <clears throat> so here's another long quote, but it's important. Um, the essence of the this time is different syndrome is simple. It's rooted in the firmly held belief that financial crises are things that happen to other people in other countries at other times. Crises don't happen to us here and now. We're doing things better. We are smarter. And we've learned from our past mistakes. The old rules of valuation don't apply. Unfortunately, a highly leveraged economy can unwittingly be sitting with its back at the edge of a financial cliff for many years before chance and circumstance provokes a crisis of confidence that pushes it off. So there, they've seen this before. You know, how many times, especially during the dot-com bust, did you hear the, the rules of value, the old rules of valuation don't apply anymore? Oh, you know, these dot com you know, you, don't, you just don't understand the new economy. They love that one. You also heard that during the real estate boom. The, the old rules of valuation no longer apply. Um, if you look through the newspapers, you'll see a lot of this same attitude in there. And they go on to say, perhaps more than anything else, failure to recognize the precariousness and fickleness of confidence is the key factor that gives rise to the this time is different syndrome. Highly indebted governments, banks, or corporations can seem to be merrily rolling along for an extended period when bang, confidence collapses, lenders disappear, and a crisis hits. Sounds kind of familiar. So what's important here is the precariousness and fickleness of confidence, that's the central theme. Because people have to have confidence in the U.S. dollar to want to, uh, to buy our treasury debt, for instance. It was just a year ago that we were saying the euro is going to replace the U.S. dollar yeah, that's as right. the reserve currency. And what's so funny... they're doing so well. And what's so funny about that is the euro is actually helping us out because they are so bad that we look even better. You know, the, the euro, uh, the eurozone is a bug in search of a windshield right now. <laughs> so and we're all out of wiper fluid. That's right. <laughs> So what, a per what you do see again and again in the history of financial crises is that when an accident is waiting to happen, it eventually does. So, um, so these, are, these people have, 
have done a huge exhaustive multi-year study of this and these are their conclusions and um, they, it contains a warning for us right now. So this accident waiting to happen, what is it? What's the accident waiting to happen? It's a currency collapse. There's probably several accidents waiting to happen, but the one that I find most worrisome is a currency collapse. So a currency collapse, what does it mean to you? Just remember it's bad. <laughs> so the most obvious thing is that people lose their life savings. If, if the dollar becomes worth, uh, worth half of what it was, or a quarter of what it was, or a tenth of what it was, or becomes worthless, people are going to lose their life savings. People have, lots of people have CDs or savings accounts. It won't be worth anymore, and, and you'll, the middle class gets destroyed. Because think about this, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, like a lot of people are, and you go to fill up your car at the gas station and suddenly it's $20 a gallon, well, what happens to you? You know, are you basically not going to buy vitamins for the baby that month, or you're not going to buy food? Who knows what? Um, so maybe it's a good idea to stock up some. <laughs> Put in a plug. And I know who can help. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but the middle class is who gets destroyed. And, but something that, that is even more scary than that, I think, is the political risk. Because if you look at incidents where this has happened before, where people, where the, a country has lost their currency, what happens is there's so much financial destruction, the, the uh, economy and, and the fabric of society <coughs> ripped apart so badly, what do people want? They, they, what they want is order. They want a strong leader. To, they don't care what they do. They don't care what this uh, leader does. They just want the leader to fix it. And things like uh, your freedoms, etc. Well, we'll worry about that later, but we have to fix this terrible crisis that we're in. Of, you know, of no fault of ours. Um, but I, I did quite a bit of looking into this, and I found some interesting examples of this in history. And the first one was uh, from Rome. Now, you might realize that um, Rome, they never had paper currency back there, so how did they just print money? Well, what they did back then was the Roman Empire, this was uh, the example I'm looking at, it was in the third century AD. In the Roman Empire, they, they were trying to expand their empire and spend too much money and you know buy a new royal barge every week or who knows what, but they were spending way too much money. And so they thought, well, I've got a solution. We've got this Roman denarius that is, is full of silver. There's more silver in there than people need to use. Let's uh, cut it in half. And so they do that. And uh, you have to realize that the only reason why people wanted to trade in Roman currency was because of the precious metals that was inside of it. And um, so as the years went by, they kept taking more and more silver out of these coins. It's basically like what we're doing, printing money. And eventually, the, the uh, currency collapsed to such an extent, it was so worthless, that even tax collectors wouldn't accept Roman currency as payment for taxes. They would show up at people's doors and say, we want that cow over here. And it's like, oh, that money? No, 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 you keep that. That's OK. You know, make some jewelry out of it or something. And so it got that bad. And, and so what happened next was they got an emperor called Diocletian. And I could go on for a long time about this guy. He was a really terrible. They had already had emperor, emperors for a long time, but this guy was bad. Just to give you some idea of his attitude, he, when he became emperor, he said, okay, you guys, you're not going to call me emperor or Diocletian. You're going to call me Dominus et Deus. And what that meant in, uh, you, you know what that means in Latin. It means Lord and God. So that's what this guy, that's um, the attitude this guy had. And um, if you wanted to talk to him, you weren't allowed to look at him. But anyway, the, um, he did many bad things. But one of the things that he did was he came up with, the, the inflation was going crazy. He came up with the Edict of Maximum Prices. 
And this might sound familiar to you in uh, some of the more, um, <coughs> you know, banana republics that we have, where they made a list of every single thing you could buy or sell in the Roman Empire, and here's the maximum price for it. You were not allowed to charge more than that. And some people did anyway, and when they got caught, they executed them. It's really simple, you know, you fix inflation that way. And even with, <laughs> even with that, it didn't work. It, it uh, just fell apart. And so he had people put to death for charging too much. Um, and the next example I found was um, there was a currency collapse um, that immediately before the French Revolution it was, a, it was a terrible thing. A lot of people um, died from that. And then immediately after that was Napoleon, who was uh, a pretty despotic kind of guy. Another um, example was Lenin. There was, because of World War I, the uh, Tsar had spent too much money and they had a currency collapse. And guess who shows up next but V.I. Lenin um, and turns it into the Soviet Union. Um, Hitler. I've read in multiple sources how they've said without the German hyperinflation in the 20s, Hitler would not have been possible. You know, there were a lot of different undercurrents, what was going on there, a lot of different reasons he came to power. But if, if without that one key thing, the currency collapse, they, it could not have happened. Um, the last example I found was Mao Zedong. Um, so in 1949, the nationalist uh, Chinese, uh, it was Chiang Kai-shek, um, they had printed way too much money. They'd gone through World War II, they were fighting, you know, they were fighting an uprising for a long time, etc., etc. Spent too much money, the currency collapsed because they printed too much of it. And suddenly Mao Zedong takes power turns China into a communist country and killed 70 million people. So, what's the point of all of this? I'm not predicting that this is going to happen in the United States. I really, I've got to have enough confidence that, you know, we have enough, you know, I say their legacy of freedom that this wouldn't happen. But what you do need to take away from this is that very bad and unpredictable happen. things happen when there's a currency collapse. Um, things that you don't want to be around for. So the next question is, all right, a currency collapse is bad, I get it. What could possibly trigger this? Well, several different things could, but we'll concentrate on this main theme here. The U.S. is the world's reserve currency. So the United States dollar is the most widely held currency in the world today. There are trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and, um, and dollar-denominated U.S. government debt um, outside of the country right now. And so it's very widely used. And um, so an average of two-thirds of total foreign exchange reserves have been in U.S. dollars in debt, and that's why they call it a reserve currency status because um, because uh, there are so many different um, uh, exchanges of dollars that go on outside of the, the country. So here's a few examples of what kind of exchanges I'm talking about. One is foreign central bank reserves. So uh, foreign central banks used to just hold gold and silver, but now they hold a They also hold a variety of foreign currencies to kind of stabilize their own currency. And um, about 60% or two thirds, it, it varies over the years, have been in U.S. dollars. So that's a significant amount of money. You think of all the foreign central uh, bank reserves. And even bigger than that is the foreign private holdings. This is foreign banks, um, foreign companies. When they, when uh, you might have India trading with um, Bangladesh, or maybe not Bangladesh, but like Russia, they they would, uh, India would take their money, convert it into dollars, buy whatever they're going to buy from Russia, maybe oil, and then the uh, Russians go uh, convert it back into their currency. 
So all sorts of trade around the world is conducted in dollars, and probably the best example is, uh, is oil, um, or what's referred to as petrodollar. And um, so this is kind of a house of cards all in itself. The, um, the Middle East countries have been complaining for years about this. They're complaining that, well, if we trade all of our oil in dollars, we're kind of getting ripped off because we have to hold all these dollars and every year the, the value goes down. And I assure you, they know they're looking at the 10% inflation, not the 2% because they're smarter than that. They don't listen to uh, CNBC. <laughs> um, and so there's actually been a movement afoot to replace dollars for an oil trading with a, uh, with a uh, Middle East currency based on gold. So who cares? Well, the reason why you should care is that if the foreign governments and com companies lose confidence in the dollar, trillions of dollars flood back into the U.S. in a short period. Now that might sound like a good thing. It's like, we, we get all our dollars back. But think about it for a second. If you have a certain number of dollars inside the boundaries of the United States, and all of a sudden there's double that, well, what's going to happen to the price of everything? It's going to, the price of everything is going to shoot up. And you can also think about this in a different way. You can think about it as just supply and demand. There's a certain demand for our little green pieces of paper that is our largest export. Um, and uh, if that demand dries up, all of a sudden...